Welcome to Murder Mile, the true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is the final part about the brutal murder of Katerina Konieva. By pure luck, her killer had been caught, and what seemed like a one off attack led to one of the most prolific and dangerous sex offenders ever, and unraveled a catalogue of failure by the authorities in both Britain and Poland. Murder Mile is researched using authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatisation of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 85, The Beast, Part 3. Today, I'm standing by bus stop K on Goldhog Road, W12. An eight-minute stroll from the former family home of Katerina Konieva. A nine-minute chug from her old school. Three tube stops east of the Beast's flat on Twyford Avenue. A full day's drive from the Konieva's homeland in North Macedonia. But 964 miles west from where this story actually began. Stop K is just a regular bus stop on an ordinary West End street. It is a single-sided perspex shelter, barely big enough for three pensioners, a pram, a small poodle and half a posterior. But at least having only one wall, the whiff of B.O., eggy breaths and bum boffs doesn't linger. It is a plastic white clean bench, dotted with cigarette burns as if someone has written help me in Morse code. A stinky bin overflowing with the salad from burgers and kebabs, meaning the bin is probably healthier than half the kids and a countdown clock, which never works. So one minute here feels like a week in Groundhog Day. 23 years after her murder, many of the family-run shops on Goldhog Road, the barbers, the bakers or the tailors, have gone. And although it seems innocent enough, bus stop K still remains. As it was here, on Thursday the 22nd of May 1997, from the comfort of his regular seat, that a sadistic and predatory paedophile would watch 12-year-old schoolgirl Katerina Kornieva exit her bus and follow her home. His name was Andre Kanowski, and he would be known as the Beast. But Katerina wasn't picked at random. She was chosen. 30 years before she was even born. In 1956, in the Polish city of Warsaw, Andrzej Kanowski was born Andrzej Klamber, the only child of Elisabeta Klamber, an unmarried mother and a habitual thief struggling to survive behind the Soviet side of the Iron Curtain. As having signed the Warsaw Pact, alongside several states in the communist bloc, including Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary and Romania, to form an uneasy alliance with the Soviet Union. Until the fall of the Berlin Wall, Poland would struggle. Conceived by accident, even as a baby, Andre wasn't loved. With an absent father, few relatives, and no brothers or sisters, he had no competition for his mother's affection. But still, it never came. Age two, Andre was committed to the Warsaw Orphanage, a bleak concrete prison full of unwanted babies and abandoned boys. But it wasn't for something bad that he had done. As coming from a small family, with his mother a thief, his father a burglar, his grandmother a fraudster, 
and his grandfather committed to a psychiatric hospital for sexual offences. As all of his family were in prison, the little boy had nowhere else to go. So for seven months solid, all he did was cry. He had no one to love him, hug him or cuddle him. He had been abandoned and he was too young to understand why. Upon his release, Elizabeth had fled to Moava, an industrial town north of Warsaw, and married a builder called Stefan Kanowski, hoping to make a better life for herself. But by then, Andre had become obsessive and clingy. Unwilling to let go of his tiny mother's legs, he cried whenever she pushed him away. He threw hysterical fits any time she ignored him. And should his dark-haired mama dare to show an ounce of affection to anyone else, the unruly child would explode in a volatile temper, only calming once he had been returned to her. And his school life was no better. As an anxious five-year-old, to Andre there was no difference between school and the orphanage. So as the little boy stood by the school gates, crying for his mother, having been mercilessly teased for being short, messy and smelly, the bigger boys also branded him a mama's boy. And although he was only little, being cursed by quick fists and a short temper, these early fights taught him to stand his ground, to use force to get whatever he wanted, and by gripping his bullies by the throat and squeezing until they apologized or passed out. He also learned to love the feeling that he could control others. As Andre grew, feeling unloved and inferior, he became fastidiously clean, with pressed shirts, shiny shoes and an excess of aftershave, as he directed his affections on the girls which appealed to him most, all of whom were petite girls with pale skin, small features, a childlike frame and long dark hair. At first, his intentions were not sexual. He just wanted to feel loved, but again he was rejected. As puberty hit, hormones raged, and unlike the bigger boys who had sprouted up, being a little fatty, stuck at five foot three, Andre became more solitary, isolated and insular. A chronic masturbator who spent hours silently sat in his bedroom, spying the streets and peeping in windows, obsessively seeking a very special sort of girl and fixated by tiny, pale brunettes. Not unlike his own mother. In 1969, age 13, Andre was arrested for the first time. It was a small offence for the minor theft of a young lady's handbag. And for that, he was sentenced to six months in a juvenile detention facility. The crime was frivolous, irrational and spontaneous. But the mugging of this young dark-haired lady wasn't about financial gain. It was about control. And it marked the start of a new and very violent phase in the life of the beast. In May 1973, age 17, having progressed from muggings and robberies to car thefts and burglaries, Andre was released from juvenile detention. His behavior was good, his attitude was fine, and having participated in a few programs, including tailoring, for which his chunky little digits seemed too big for such fine work, but his skill was undeniable. The prison felt he had been rehabilitated. Only he hadn't. This incarceration only made his obsession worse. Every day was a cruel reminder of his time at the orphanage, when trapped behind iron bars and concrete walls. All he could think about was the affections of his mother. And now, free but unable to have her, he would go after the next best thing. In June 1973, a few weeks after his release, 
Andre dragged his 13-year-old neighbor off his own street into some bushes and raped her. It was daylight, she knew him, and he didn't wear a disguise. That may seem odd, almost bizarre, but everything which became the hallmark of his attacks, including the brutal murder of Katerina Konyeva, started right here. As with each and every victim, although their ages varied, all were small elfin brunettes with a childlike look. All were chosen, followed and watched to make sure that they were alone. All were dragged into the bushes, fields, or if it was empty, their own home. He used his own knife to threaten them, his own hand to silence them, but he never brought anything with him to throttle them. Instead, he made do with whatever he could find, whether a belt, some tights, a curtain cord, even their own shoelaces. Having controlled them by fear, each victim was strangled to the point of unconsciousness and raped. A sadistic torture he would inflict on each girl again and again and again. And then, only after they had kissed him and told him that they loved him, he would let them go. He was arrested, tried, and with two more girls having identified Andre Kanowski as their attacker, as a convicted rapist and highly dangerous paedophile, he was sent to prison for just three years. He served his time, he was released, and with his obsession now even worse, his terrifying spree of the rape and strangulation of young women and little girls started immediately and never ceased. Sometimes he attacked once a year, but often he attacked several times a day. What follows are only the rapes that a court could prove. 16th of July, 1977. One month after his release, he raped and choked a young-looking 24-year-old woman. He was arrested and tried, but served just nine months in prison. 12th of April, 1978. One week after his release, having failed to rape a 22-year-old woman who had fought him off, just hours later, he raped and robbed a 27-year-old woman and escaped capture. 20th of April 1978, just eight days later, he raped a 16-year-old girl. In June and July 1978, he committed three rapes. 4th of June, a 22-year-old. 23rd of June, a 16-year-old. And on the 21st of July, a 12-year-old girl who he had strangled and left for dead. After that, there were two more rapes in August, four in September, four in one week during October, four more in November, with his youngest victim so far being just 11 years old, and two more rapes in December, a 16-year-old, and just three days before Christmas, another 11-year-old. Why he hadn't been caught still beggars belief. By the start of a new year, with his attack seeing no sign of abating, on the 26th of January 1978, in a single day, he raped three more women. Thankfully, owing only to luck, having recklessly left his fingerprints at the scene, Andrzej Kanowski was arrested, and finally, as one of Poland's most prolific rapists and paedophiles, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. But even in an all-male prison, his sexual assaults continued. On the 24th of January 1979, he forced a small dark-haired cellmate to perform oral sex on him. One week later, he raped another cellmate. And as a fine example of just how incompetent the Polish justice system was, somehow, on the 25th of April 1979, he escaped from prison. Six weeks later, he raped a 13-year-old girl as she walked home from school. He was arrested, re-escaped from prison, 
and committed six further rapes before being re-arrested in 1983 and was sentenced to 30 years in a maximum security prison for which he would never escape. And he wouldn't escape. No. Instead, they let him out. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. By 1989, following the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of communism, and to celebrate the election of Poland's first democratically elected president, Lech Walesa, as part of an offender amnesty, the Polish government released hundreds of prisoners, one of whom was Andrzej Kanowski, having served just six years out of 30. In 1992, he was released. He married, fathered a daughter, got a job as a door-to-door cosmetic salesman and raped at least three more girls. The youngest was just 10. But the authorities' incompetence didn't end there. Andrzej Kanowski was a violent, calculated and deeply disturbed psychopath who was unrepentant for his crimes, unsympathetic of his victims and unable to stop his spree of rape and strangulation. He was a repeat offender with no chance of rehabilitation who over 30 years was convicted of more than 70 charges of rape, abduction, sexual assault and the attempted murder of young women, girls and children leaving possibly hundreds of victims physically and emotionally scarred for life. So given his history of lying, burglary, prison breaks, rape and paedophilia, it would be unfathomable to think that the Polish legal system would give him any leniency in his sentence. But on the 24th of June 1996, whilst re-imprisoned for further counts of child rape, Having falsely claimed that he needed hip surgery, a judge released him from prison for three months, unsupervised. Over the next three months, he sold his flat, he packed his bags, he emptied his bank account and applied for and received a tourist visa from the Polish government. And when those three months were up, having never had an operation, or knocked on the prison gates asking to be let back in. Only then did the Polish authorities realize that their most prolific and dangerous sex offender ever was missing. His fingerprints, his photographs and his DNA were submitted to Interpol so that every country in Europe could protect their people and help catch this violent escaped criminal. Only they would never catch him. But his getaway wasn't a high-speed chase. It wasn't clever, brazen or covert. Instead, on the morning of Monday the 14th of October 1996, having bought a fake passport in a false name, Andrzej Kanowski boarded a coach in Warsaw and armed only with a box of sandwiches and a bag of crisps. Over the next 24 hours, he sat there, quietly, watching his old life vanish into the distance As for a one-way ticket that cost just 20 pounds, he was waved through the immigration checkpoints in Germany, Belgium and France, unchallenged, until his coach boarded the ferry to Calais. In a catalogue of colossal errors, the Polish authorities had failed every woman, girl and child who had come into contact with one of their most prolific rapists. And now he was on the boat to England. I would love to tell you that the British authorities spotted his fake passport. I would love to tell you that they suspected his false name. I would love to tell you that they saw his well-publicized face and with alarms ringing, dogs barking and guns drawn, he was dragged from the coach, searched, arrested and swiftly deported back to Poland before his tiny size five boots could set foot on English soil. I would love to tell you that that's what happened, but it didn't. On the morning of Tuesday the 15th of October 1996, Andrzej Kanowski had his passport stamped, his visa approved, 
and having arrived in Victoria bus station, he vanished amongst the crowds of West London. But he didn't go into hiding. Instead, he blended in. With a fake passport of a Portuguese national, false papers in the name of Jose Marco de Diaz, an appearance which looked Spanish or Portuguese, but was often mistaken for Greek or Arabic, and speaking in an accent that many people could only describe as foreign, this new arrival didn't stick out. With sad eyes, small hands and a smooth face, this fastidiously neat little man, who had needles and thread in his bag for his embroidery and milk and biscuits for his nightly cup of tea, this new stranger didn't seem a threat to anyone. So the unassuming little man, known only as Jose Marco de Diaz, acquired himself a ground floor bedsit on Twyford Avenue and being a skilled tailor, found a nice little job at a dry cleaners on Goldhook Road. Just a few feet from bus stop K and just one street from the home of Katerina Konyeva. Thursday the 22nd of May 1997 was just an ordinary day. It was warm, clear and dry. Since 8am, Andre sat in his usual spot in the window of the dry cleaners. A neat little man on a neat little chair at a neat little desk, perched behind a tidy array of bobbins, needles and threads as he watched the world go by. Being a pleasant chap, some people passed and waved, others popped in for sewing tips, and whereas, with his chunky little digits seemingly too big for such fine work, but his skill undeniable, many people handed him their most intimate garments, which just hours before had clung close to their bodies. His window seat was the perfect vantage point. As a tailor, it had good natural light. Being occasionally quite a monotonous job, this busy street was never dull. And as a convicted paedophile, being perched within the sight of bus stop K, the school run was like a conveyor belt of loveliness, as bus after bus of delicious little girls, in short skirts, white socks and tight blouses, were paraded before his eyes. And although he liked the look of them, most didn't appeal to him, as he knew what he liked. He had a type. With his shift coming to an end, as the clock neared ten to four, Andre finished stitching the hem onto the skirt of a school uniform and packed up for the day. His plan? To go home, have a bath, a meal, a bit of telly and a sleep. The same as anyone else. But all that changed at 3.50pm with the arrival of the number 94 bus from Notting Hill Gate and Katerina. In his eyes, it was a spontaneous decision by a chance encounter with a total stranger, as all of his attacks were. And although he hadn't sought a little girl to rape, that primal urge that he had to act on that instant was triggered by the sight of a pretty petite girl with long dark hair, who reminded him of his mother. Keeping a safe distance, as he watched the soft swish of her grey skirt and the bounce of her Virgin Airlines bag, which was slung across her tiny chest by a thick red strap, her walk was quick, but not fast as if she was frightened, but eager as if she had exciting news. And as he followed the little girl down Hammersmith Grove, Benbow Road and on to Ifley Road, she unwittingly led him right to her home. Behind the corner of Hebron Road, the front of 35 Ifley Road was completely visible. From this spot, he saw her unlock the door, call for her daddy, daddy. and get no reply. Via a small glass panel above, he saw her pop on the hall light 
trot upstairs, and with the blinds of the bay window open, he watched as she went from room to room, calling Daddy, but still getting no reply. Until finally, in the front room, which overlooked the street, she slung her bag, popped on the TV, and closed her bedroom blinds. From outside, he heard the home phone ring, which she never answered. Perhaps she had music on, perhaps the TV was too loud, or perhaps she was in the shower. But as she didn't answer it, and no one else did, as he broke in, he knew one thing for certain: that this little girl was all alone. What happened next to Katerina was never reported publicly, but as his method didn't deviate in almost thirty years, it is based on the testimony of his last Polish victim, as well as many others. On the sixteenth of May, nineteen ninety-five. Two years before Katerina's murder, the beast had spotted fourteen-year-old schoolgirl Anieszka Grzybica hop off the bus, walk down her street, and enter her home alone. She was a petite, elfin-faced teen, with a tiny body and long dark hair, just like his mama. The empty house was eerily silent, except for the soft creak of his footsteps. And the muffled hum of kids' TV, with the little girl's uniform slung on the floor, and her school bag dumped by the door, it was clear, with no adults inside, there was no one there to protect her. So, having followed her solitary sounds, the beast pushed open her bedroom door. Inside, the little girl was sat on a small pink bed. A dark-haired dot, amongst a sea of soft toys and plush teddies, happily playing, as this was a safe place. Hearing the door creak, she turned, expecting to see her daddy. But instead, in her own home, in the doorway of her own bedroom, stood a stranger. Before she could say a word, the beast shushed her. Shh, it's okay. I'm here to see your father. Is he in? Confused, she shook her head. Her instinct should have been to shout or scream, but as the neat little man with sad eyes and a sweet smile didn't seem threatening, when he said, "Then I'll wait here, okay?" It seemed fine, as he sat beside her on the bed and made small talk about dollies to pass the time. Having gained her trust, the beast asked, "Can you keep a secret?" She nodded. "Good. I want you to kiss me," he said as he stroked her long dark hair. The terrified girl froze. "Come on, kiss me," he barked, but the little lookalike of his beloved mama said nothing. And as his anger rose, "Kiss me now, love me." As the petrified girl wept and shook her head, gripping her soft pale throat in his hairy little hand, the beast repeatedly strangled and raped the little girl, taking her close to the point of death, again and again and again, in a sustained and brutal attack, lasting over an hour, until he was done. And then, as he would have done with Katerina, had he not been disturbed by her daddy. Untying the cord which choked her, the beast asked, "You do love me, yes?" The terrified teen nodded. "So kiss me," which she did. And having got exactly what he wanted, the beast left, and this little girl lived. Over the next five years, until the rape of the unidentified South Korean woman. The beast would vanish, but just like with the Polish authorities, whose catalogue of errors had let a prolific paedophile roam free, so would the British. Speeding south, Andrei Kanowski dumped the stolen car by Hammersmith bus station 
and caught the district line tube home. The police found the car, recovered his fingerprints, and although they proved to be a positive match to Katerina's killer, they didn't match anyone on the police national database. Of course, the police could have checked with Interpol, but they didn't. One month after her murder, having been arrested for stealing a small amount of petty cash from Sittington Farm in Ledbury, Herefordshire, where he worked as a strawberry picker, for the minor offence of theft, he should have been fingerprinted. But as the charge was dropped, he wasn't. Instead, having admitted to immigration officers that he wasn't Portuguese, but was actually Polish, even though he was using a fake passport in the false name of Jose Marco de Diaz. In 1998, one year after Caterina's murder, he applied for UK asylum, and whilst his application was considered, he was allowed to walk free. As he had entered the country illegally, the UK Immigration Service should have taken his fingerprints. If they had, they'd have known that Jose Marco de Diaz was an alias, that Andre Kanowski was his real name, that he was a wanted fugitive with a 30-year history of child rape, abduction, attempted murder, and now murder. But they didn't. Instead, during the three years that his asylum application was assessed, he worked a series of regular jobs in and around West London. He lived in a ground floor flat just yards from the Japanese school, a prep school in West Acton for petite preteen brunettes. And even though he was arrested in July 2002 for falsely claiming for benefits, he was released and underwent a heart bypass operation courtesy of the British taxpayer. On the 14th of August 2002, his UK asylum application was rejected. And although the British authorities ordered him to be deported back to Poland, he failed to show up and they failed to track him down to his own flat in West Acton. One month later, in that same flat, he brutally raped a South Korean student. That attack, and only that attack, having left his DNA and his fingerprints at the scene, finally led to the imprisonment of Poland's most prolific child rapist and the murderer of 12-year-old Katarina Konieva. Andrzej Kanowski was given a whole life sentence which he served at HMP Franklin, one of the UK's toughest maximum security prisons. As a risk to women, children, and even other prisoners, he was kept in solitary confinement, supervised 24 hours a day, and for the rest of his natural life, he would never see beyond the prison walls. Unlike in Poland, where he had broken out of prison three times, the beast would never escape HMP Franklin. But it wasn't for the want of trying. Instead, it was his own little fat body that proved to be his executioner. As on the 23rd of September 2009, 52-year-old Andrzej Konowski died of heart failure. But even his death brought very little comfort to the Konieva family. In a statement, the family said, Today, I do not feel happy. I wish that I was not giving this statement and that Katerina was still by my side. I am relieved that this evil man can no longer murder or sexually assault another young girl. But my daughter is gone. Traj and Zakalina have since divorced the family continue to try to rebuild their lives, and each birthday and Christmas, they take presents to Katerina's grave. But every day is a struggle, a constant reminder of their beautiful little girl, cruelly taken so young. I talk to her every day and every night. I always say goodnight to my daughter. 
This episode is dedicated to the memory of Katerina Konyeva and the hundreds of women and girls who were attacked by the beast, having been failed by the authorities in both Britain and Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. That was part three of a three-part series on the beast. Next week, we return to single-part episodes. And as always, after the break, there's more nonsense with Extra Mile. But first, this. Is listening to true crime podcasts all the time getting you down, but you just can't stop? Try listening to Bloody Murder. We're an Australian comedy true crime podcast focusing on some of the lesser-known murder cases from Australia and around the globe. We use black comedy as a means to tell horrifying true crime stories. But our humour is respectful and never at the expense of victims or their loved ones. Our episodes cover everything from Australian gangland figures like Chopper Reed to black widows and women who kill disputes between neighbours that turn to murder identity theft killings bushrangers and serial killers you won't have heard covered elsewhere. We get straight into the case with no banter or chit-chat beforehand. That's because the podcast is about true crime, not what we had for lunch. Our fresh, well-researched episodes are released every Monday. Bloody Murder has been nominated for four Australian Podcast Awards. We've been going for over three years now. So we have loads of episodes for you to binge. You can listen to Bloody Murder on Spotify and any of your favourite podcatchers. Before that... A thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Tracy Keach and Dark Master. I thank you. I hope you enjoyed your goodies and all of the extra online goodies you will have received via Patreon. Also, a thank you to Amy Hussein for the cakes, which have since mysteriously disappeared. Burp. Murder Mile was research written and performed by myself with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Unless, of course, you've just woken up, and then don't sleep well because that would mean you'd be going back to sleep which wouldn't make any sense at all unless you plan to sleep all day which is something to be quite nice rather than waking up early every bloody day sometimes it's just nice to have a sleep in isn't it just just to stay in bed and go bollocks to this can't be asked i did that the, the, this sunday just gone because I, I did i managed to do i managed to edit together the last episode in about two days which is a miracle because it normally takes three but um I was I pretty much powered through that because I needed to get stuff done and then I was going to wake up Sunday morning before my tours and go and do stuff and I thought I woke up at five getting ready to get into town and I thought bollocks to this and I decided instead to stay in bed till about nine and that was really nice so I did that cool okay right extra mile is here da, 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 da. welcome everyone extra mile time well, I have a bit of a, 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 tea, a cup of tea and a cake and a waffle and we talk about crap. And right, uh, I'm going to pop on the kettle as always. Oh, so I'm going to make a cup of tea. Tea o'clock. Have some nice PG. I've just had a... Um, hang on, I'm filling up the kettle. Uh, I always have to fill up the kettle because I only put in enough water for one cup of tea because there's no point wasting lots of gas uh, to make to have hot water then heat it up and then cool it down and all that crap um, a couple of days ago I bought some uh, coffee which was marked as Intenso yeah and you should never I think I think the lesson is you should never you should unless you like strong coffee you should never really buy yourself uh, some coffee marked as Intenso Oh dear lord, I'm used to kind of like medium strength coffee, but this was lethal, absolutely bloody lethal. And so I put my usual two spoonfuls of uh, coffee in there. Oh, I just couldn't focus all day. The rest of the day was a washout. I spent spent the day just literally going, what is going wrong with my head? My head hurt so much. So um, I'm currently playing coffee roulette, which I do a lot, which is I, I, I have a big jar of Kenko and then I... I 
I got it down to about uh, a quarter empty and then I put in another jar of something else, something random, and then I mix it up. And then when that gets a quarter down or a third down, I put in another jar. So it's so it's now coffee roulette. So in there is Kenko, uh, a cheapy one from Tesco's, the Intenso one to balance it out, uh, and some other stuff as well. So it, it's nice. It's weird. Now it's kind of a random coffee. It's interesting. Coffee roulette. Give it a go. Oh, so got my tea brewing that's there got a cake oh cake i forgot about cake yeah i've got uh on the tour this week the one just gone amy very kindly bought me some uh bake or tart and some uh tunnocks so yes pronounced it right tunnocks tea cakes i've still got them I haven't picked through them all yet i know it's a miracle they're still there but now i've got a, a, a belgian bun not a Belgian bun from my crack dealer, uh, Wenzel's, the baker's. Oh, really good. It's a Tesco's one, but it'll do me just fine. Uh, what's going on today? It's been pissing down, as always. Pissing down outside. It's been. It's quite nice. It's nice when you're, when you're on the boat. Last night, I was just sitting there because it's a steel hull. When it's raining, you can hear every single raindrop hitting the boat. And it's like, dun, 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 dun. it's like big, big steel... Uh, echoes so it's nice to listen to when it's really pissing it down you can just lie there at, at night and not listen to anything else because I don't have a telly uh, I just sit there and just listen to, to the rain that's really nice uh, coots are outside today they're being a little bit noisy but not too noisy there's a, 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 couple, a couple of two and then another couple of two and then there's some ducks and there's some swans that come past and there's some uh, cormorants as well that are um, a group of cormorants. I've never seen a group of cormorants before, but they are here. Uh, they're normally solitary. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, why have I put that there? Let's do that. Okay. Uh, so we, uh, as of by the time you listen to this, I will have not look at, look at, looked at the news for three months. It's great. It feels really good. I feel so happy. No news. No, I've realised it's all bollocks. It is all bollocks. I've mentioned this before. Really do give it a go. Give it a go. Switch off all of your apps. Uh, don't look at newspapers. Don't watch the news. Uh, I, even as I walk past newsstands, I don't look at the headlines. I ignore all those. If I'm on social media, I don't look at anyone else's shit. I just ignore it now because I realise it's just bollocks. It really is. Like all this coronavirus stuff, everyone's panicking about it. Everyone's going, oh, panicking. Oh, I've got to buy lots of toilet t- tissue. Oh, we're all going to die. But it's like, as someone rightfully pointed out, they said, last week in Motherwell, three young men committed suicide. It's like, yeah, you're right. Like a little vill- like a little town in Scotland, three young men committed suicide. And yet we're, all we're talking about is this virus. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why are we focused on that? Why are we not focusing on other stuff? Like, oh, my tea's about to go. My tea's about to go. Hang on. Uh, I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to let it stew. Remind me to go back for my tea because I will forget it. It's like, it's like the numbers of people who die of food poisoning going into a restaurant each day is ridiculous. But are, are we focused on that? No, not at all. It's like, do you know, you, you could spend you could spend all of your time panicking. I know people out there now go, oh, coronavirus, coronavirus. And now you're know, washing their hands every six seconds and using antiseptic and all that. But the irony is you could go to a, a restaurant with the cleanest hands in the world and you don't know how the person is cooking their food or whether it's clean or where it's come from and you could get food poisoning and die so you spend all your time worrying about this not knowing why you want to worry about this with your you could you could be killed by all of the toilet paper that you've stockpiled in your house it's ridiculous so um Here's my top tip. Just just don't look at the news. Just ignore it. You don't need it. Unless it's vital to your job, you don't need it. Uh, I've gone three months without it. I've no idea what the big orange face twat in America is doing. I've no idea what his baby version that unfortunately we have to suffer in this country is. Boris the wanker. Uh, what he's doing, I don't care. I don't give a shit. Uh, I, 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 pfft, some famous people have died. I don't care. Really don't care. All you need to know about is what's going on in your life. And if... You make your life happy and good. Great. That's all you need to know. So, oh, 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 tea is, right, right. yes. Oh, oh. Get my tea, get the tea bag out. 
It was only kind of about two minutes, but for me it's enough. I don't like it too stewed. There's nothing worse than a tea that's over stewed. Stewed tea is good, but not, if you leave it in for too long, it, it becomes a bit, a bit kind of coarse, a bit harsh. Uh, what else have we got? What else have we got? Um, yesterday, weirdly, I was riding along on my bike and a big bulldog tried to hug me whilst I was riding the bike, which is weird. He kept running beside me, then going underneath the bike and it's big, fat, big, fat bulldog. Yeah, it looked like he was, he needed to lose some weight. Coot. Coot, yeah, there he is. Uh, his, his mouth is always open. Uh, what else have we got? Um, as mentioned before, all the ringtones are now available. Loads of people are downloading, which is great. Just, just help yourselves. There's no, uh, the, you don't have to put in credit card details. All it is is you just uh, just select whatever you want. You can have all of them. You can have one of them, whatever. Uh, uh, the, uh, they all get stored into a cart. All you'll be asked for is uh, your name. The important thing is the email address because they because they'll need. Uh, the system will email them to you. You won't be asked for your home address and you won't be asked for credit card details unless you purchase something above which costs something. Everything else, you won't be asked for anything like that. It's just email address. Uh, and I, I don't send you uh, bullshit emails afterwards. I'm not one of these. I don't store them anywhere and they're not stored by the system as well. So help yourself, dive in. Whew. As mentioned before, I will be attending UK Crime Con on the 27th of June, 2020 in London. Uh, I think I put a link to that in part one of uh, the beast, but I might have forgotten, so I'll put another link on here. Or just search on, online for UK, UK true crime con dot com. Uh, I'm going to be there. Paul from uh, 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 True Crime Enthusiast is there. They Walk Among Us is there. Mike Megas from Case File there. I think Sinead from Men's Rear is going to be there. Who else is there? There's some more people. This, uh, so it'll be really, hopefully it'll be really good. And I think it'll be, turn up, I think it'll meet all of us. I think I think we might be doing some talks as well. I'm going to uh, uh, plan to do something for that. So that'll be good. Uh, also, as mentioned last week, a new exciting thing. We've got a new tour. So it's the podcasters only tour. This is a tour only for people, because on my regular tour, I have people who like true crime, don't like true crime, listen to the podcast, don't listen to the podcast. Whoop, but whereas um, I decided to do a podcast just for you guys, people who listen to the pocket podcast and like, so I could just point out locations and we can have a little chat about it. It's very unscripted. It's kind of free form, but the idea is it's three hours. We have a, a, a nice meander, bit of fun. Um, so those tours are online now on the, uh, on the eShop only available via the eShop. Uh, if you bought tickets to my regular tour, I can't transfer them across. They're entirely different systems. So if you bought a ticket to my regular tour, um, we can't do the swaps at all. But uh, so, uh, yeah, it's on the 22nd of March this year, which is the UK Mother's Day. It's at 2 p.m. It'll last about three hours. By the time you hear this message, it's probably already sold out. Hopefully it's already sold out. There's only 30 tickets. But if it goes well, I'll do one a month. Uh, and I probably won't do I won't do them as private tours I don't think you can book them as private tours because I don't think it'll be worth financially it won't be uh, cost efficient to do that but um, that'll be that so that's something new that's something exciting uh, and if that goes well we'll do more podcasted tours you know, maybe in a different location I don't know or we'll have some fun anyway questions 10 questions about the podcast episode you just listened to so everyone seems to be enjoying this so i'll keep doing this this is uh good so question number one what was andre's mother's name question two what was andre's birth name question number three what happened to him aged two Following on from last week's question, which was our question 10 from last week, what did Andre do as a job? You can see why I deliberately left that as a kind of a... I didn't tell you the answer last week because it's important for the, the episode you just listened to. Uh, question number five. What free gift did Andre receive courtesy of the UK taxpayer? I'm sure that that is in the Daily Mail. I'm sure all the Daily Mail readers are going, rrr, rrr, bloody phoners coming over here. Um, uh, episode six. 
What institution was just a few yards from Andre's flat on Twyford Avenue? A coot's trying to answer the question. Uh, ep- uh, question seven. I almost said episode seven. Question seven. What bus stop did Katerina get off on Goldhawk Road? Episode eight. What prison was Andre Kanowski sent to? Question nine. What did he ask 14-year-old schoolgirl Agnieszka Grzybica? God, it took me ages to learn to say that. And there's also five different variations of a Grzybica online. It's really annoying. I, I went through a kind of an tr- online translator, and there were five different versions of Grzybica. And I'm like, well, I'll go with the popular one. Uh, what What did Andre ask 14-year-old schoolgirl An- Agnieszka Grzybica to do before he left her bedroom? And question 10. What two years were his first what two years were his first and last arrest? So what year was he first ar- arrested? What year was he last arrested? Uh we will do the answer to those very shortly. So uh I thought I'd throw in some extra things. Oh do you know in the end uh, I pretty much put everything into all of these episodes there was very little that I left out. I kind of I had to speed through the last bit because I didn't want to go into the whole bullshit about uh, all the stuff about the the home office bungling stuff up but um something i didn't put in in 1998 so this is the year after the murder of katarina konieva um uh they they found out that andre kanowski was in the united kingdom or they worked out that he was probably in the united kingdom but they hadn't connected him to the uh, katarina konieva murder um so what he did was he sent a letter to the British immigration authorities uh, saying that he re- he'd rep- returned to Poland. Uh, and it was postmarked from Poland. But what it is, it's most likely that they're saying is that what uh, probably happened was he got his mum to send the letter. Because uh, his mum was still there and his mum still did frequent visits from Poland to the UK and went to his, uh, his, f- his flat in uh, uh, Twyford Avenue in West Acton. Uh, but uh, uh, even though, even though, uh, so uh, the Polish authority, sorry, the uh, British immigration official, officials listed him as missing, and there was no real active attempt to find him. Um, even though uh, at that time he he owned a Renault, uh, a little car, uh, which was his car, and he had uh, insurance details for that, which listed his address, so they knew exactly where he lived if, they, if they'd bothered to look. So uh, yeah. Um, a Home Office spokesman later said of the situation, it is a matter of great concern that this invid- individual with such a serious criminal history managed to get into this country and that his background was not uncovered when he came to our attention. Our system has been completely overhauled. There are those words that we hear all the time. Our system has been completely overhauled since then. All suspected of asylum seekers are now electronically fingerprinted on entry and these details are then fed into the European Warning Index, which would alert us to criminal activity. Although in Andrei Kanowski's case, it wouldn't have done, because, uh, oh no, actually, he was using a false name, but his fingerprints were still there. Uh, so yeah, that would have stopped him. Mm. Um, now, um, one thing I was going to put in there, this was actually going to, I was going to do an extra episode about this, but I, I just felt that three was enough, and we didn't need to go any deeper into this. But, you, I think with this case, you always have to ask yourself a question. Given the fact that sometimes he committed rapes once a year that we know of, because don't forget, these are the only the ones that he was charged with. But given the fact that he raped, he was charged with rape at least once a year, but sometimes we know that he committed rapes several times a day. Um, how many attacks were there in Britain that he committed, given the fact that he was in Britain from late 1997 until early, uh, until middle of 2002? Um, so there, there must be many, probably hundreds in, in Poland especially, but also here that were never reported. Um, now, police have linked him to... Uh, uh, several investigations, including uh, the disappearances of, of uh, several young women in, in East London, uh, sorry, West London. So, uh, one of them was 19 year old student Elizabeth Chow in 1999. He was in London at that point. Uh, Lola Shankoa, 
uh, a 27 year old uh, she also i believe that was ealing we'll go into that very shortly which is west acton and where he picked up the south korean uh, student and uh the murder of alice gross in hanwell which is not too far away so i'll read you some stuff online about that uh okay uh this was from the ealing times this is on elizabeth chow uh, her disappearance uh, da, 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 da. so Thames Valley University that's over in Ealing uh, she was a student uh, Elizabeth Chow she vanished on the 16th of April 1999 which is when he was here uh, after handing in an assignment and then going for a drink in the student union bar she was last seen by a friend walking down Uxbridge Road um, Uxbridge Road is huge just so you know it's not it starts in uh, Shepherd's Bush but it goes all the way to Uxbridge, which is a good couple of miles away. But this was in West Ealing, so not too far away from Ealing Broadway Station, where he picked up the um, the South Korean girl. Uh, she was last seen by a friend walking down Uxbridge Road towards her home in West Ealing at about 5.30pm and was later spotted on CCTV cameras walking past Ealing Police Station, not too far from, from the train station, uh, just after 6pm. Despite extensive inquiries and appeals for news, the 19-year-old has never been found. Uh, uh, da, 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 just a bit about her sister and their search for this. So she is, uh, they believe that she is connected to Andre Kanowski. She has never been found. Um, uh, there's Lola Shenkoya. Uh, her disappearance has always been linked by the police to another um, da, 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 da. Okay, so she went vanishing from Perryvale, not too far from here. It's not too far from uh, kind of uh, Acton area uh, on January the 3rd, 2000. So that's the same era, uh, area and period that Andre Kanowski was here. Uh, police believe Miss Shenkoya returned home sometime between 4 and 4.30 p.m. from Entertainment UK, where she worked as a temp. She was unable to get into her home in Syndicum Avenue in Ealing because her sister, who, who had the only key, was not home. It is believed she then caught the E2 bus from Northfields Avenue, Eek, that's where I used to live, uh, where she got off outside the Burger King on Ealing Broadway. The Burger King on Ealing Broadway is literally just down from, uh, it's between Ealing uh, Police Station and uh, Ealing Broadway train station so this is exactly the place where where the last lady just mentioned was uh, was last seen and she has not been seen since uh, detectives questioned serial rapist Andre Kanowski who has since died about both girls but no concrete evidence was found to him uh, linking him to their disappearances uh, or that's concrete evidence I mean uh, given the fact that they've never been found how can you really have concrete evidence uh, and there's also another one, a 14-year-old Alice Gross. Uh, now, just to say, the first two ladies, again, small, petite, dark-haired. Um, Alice Gross, 14-year-old teen, lived in Hanwell. Um, uh, her body was eventually found about a month after she was murdered. Uh, her body was found wrapped in plastic and weighed down by logs in a pit, uh, in a pit dug in a riverbed. Uh, the murder investigation, which involved 300 officers and more than a dozen police forces across the UK, has a prime suspect. Now, the prime suspect in this one, uh, we might do something about him, is Arnis Valkalnis, a convicted murderer from Latvia who vanished from his home in West London just days after Alice went missing. Um, now, police suspect him, but he, uh, but Andre Kanowski is also connected to this case as well, possibly, although... I would say, given the fact that Alice Gross is blonde-haired, and we know that uh, Kanowski has an, a bit of an obsession with dark-haired girls, for me, it seems just a bit of a stretch that, yes, she's young, yes, she's petite, but it just doesn't, you know, she's blonde-haired. It just, it, it, it doesn't, why would he all of a sudden he just make a decision to go attacking a, a blonde-haired girl when all the rest were... Um, Da, 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 brunettes so we don't know but if, if you think to yourself given the fact that he was in London from a uh, West London from 1997 to 2002 and he was in Herefordshire and he was in Oxfordshire for a period of that time you have to ask really how many how many kind of attacks did he commit there must be hundreds hundreds so uh but given the fact that he's dead given the fact that you know 
Many many have probably gone unreported, so we'll probably we'll probably never know. Uh, so that was that. Let's go and do the answer to the questions. How long have we been on? Right, good. Okay. Whoa, the ten questions. Question number one. We won't have a slurp of tea. Oh. Question number one. What was Andre's mother's name? Her name was Elisabetta Clambert. So if you got that right, then you would get question two right. What was Andre's birth name? His birth name was Andre Clambert. Because don't forget, uh, uh, his mother remarried uh, Stefan uh, Kanowski. What happened to Andre, age two? He was sent to the Warsaw Orphanage. Question from last week. Uh, question four. What did Andre do as a job? He was a tailor in a dry cleaners on Goldhawk Road. Obviously, uh, the, the the original dry cleaners, uh, they never really lit... It, it, because we can't get access to the original police file, so I've kind of had to use multiple sources to try and get all these details together, and I've kind of... I've tried to pick it uh, pick it apart as much as possible, but they never list they never listed which dry cleaners he worked at. Um, so hence, I've never used an exact address on that. So even though there's dry cleaners nearby now, they may be the original ones. They may not be the original ones. So uh, we don't know. So until the file is released, uh, we won't know what dry cleaners it was. But there is there's there's two currently two within uh, within sight of bus stop K currently. Um, question number five what free gift did he receive courtesy of the taxpayer the answer was a heart bypass operation question six what institution was just a few yards from Andre's flat on Twyford Avenue this is something that I always find really fascinating especially in the press is that the press didn't pick this up it's really simple. It's like if this is the problem is this is why I try not to use newspapers is because they don't phys, they don't physically go into locations anymore. They just sit on their fat asses and spend most of their time just online, just going oh a source said. But really, the, when they say a source said, what they mean is someone on Twitter. Do you know they don't have time to do proper research anymore. Whereas if you go to this location, you go to Twyford Avenue as I did. You'll see the videos online. And I w walked up and down the street to try and work out where Andre would have lived because they never listed it. And, I, you know, it's quite a long street. Uh, but right in the middle of it is the Japanese school. And that's the answer to question six, the Japanese school. So even though he moved to an area which was full of Eastern Europeans, so he could kind of blend in. Not too far from where he lived was a school full of very young Japanese girls obviously all small all kind of uh, elfin faced all got long dark hair exactly the thing he wanted so uh, that's that's pretty scary uh, question number seven what bus stop did Katerina get off at on Goldhawk Road easy one stop K question eight what prison did Andre Kanowski what prison was Andre Kanowski sent to uh, that's HMP Franklin that's up in County Durham, up in the northeast of England. Uh, HMP Franklin, it's a category A prison. It's like you've got you've got A, B, C. Uh, a is uh, the most serious. It's the maximum security prison. It's where they send all the serial killers. I think I think there's about eight in the country, and Franklin is one of those. Uh, question number nine. Uh, coots having a moment. Ugh. Question number nine. Uh, what did Andre ask 14-year-old schoolgirl Agnieszka Grzybica to do before he left her bedroom? Answer was, he he asked her to kiss him and to say that she loved him. See, this is another thing in the press. They really didn't pick up on this. It's like they sometimes they barely mentioned it. And for me, this this is his motivation right there. That's everything you need to know about him and his life. Is that I'm not trying to make him sound nice to you with this episode it was a hard one to write because what i want what i didn't want to do was make you uh, uh, feel sorry for him what i wanted to do is kind of make you understand where he comes from because you don't just wake up and murder people you don't just wake up and rape people it's like wh what is his failings what's going on in his brain because then you understand why he why he killed 
Katerina Konyeva, someone he'd never met, someone he, he, you know, until that moment they'd never met. He didn't know anything about her. He didn't know her name. He didn't know where she lived. He didn't know anything about her. But I think what I wanted to do was get across the idea that um, he's got abandonment issues. He's got kind of an Oedipal thing going on with his mum. And that there's a kind of a, a, a desire to have to to finally get control and have someone love him, some because he never really got the the love that he really wanted from his mum. So, uh, uh, so yeah, that's all there. Uh, so yeah, uh, question answer to question number nine. He asked her to kiss him and to say that she loved him. Uh, he would do this with most of his victims. And question number ten, what two years were his first and last arrest? His first arrest was in 1969, that's when he was 13 years old, that was the uh, theft of a handbag, and 2002, uh, that was his arrest for the murder of the South Korean girl, although you could probably put in the, uh, the arrest, oh, hmm. well this is what we said, 2002 is the arrest of the Korean girl and uh, would be Katerina Konyeva, but... Whether he was arrest, re-arrested after that whilst in prison for other offences, we don't know because they've never been listed. Mm. But, OK, it's 1969 to 2002. Right, Whoa, that was that. That was all done. Good. I've got a tea to drink. I've got a, a cake to eat. Uh, I'm going to power through this, try and edit as much of this today. And then tomorrow, I'm trying to I'm trying to get my set of, herself ahead of the game because I'm a little bit behind at the moment. I want to get ahead. I'm trying to get a day ahead each week and fighting against it. So um, I'm going to edit a bit of this today, and I'm going to start writing the new episode next week's episode tomorrow, uh, and then I'm going to edit this one in the evenings. And then so so this is Monday. Is it Monday? Yeah, Monday. This is Monday. So hopefully, is it Monday today? I don't know what day it is. Is it Monday or Tuesday? I have no idea. I'm really lost. I think today... It's Tuesday. Fuck, day behind. Right, so record this today. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Oh, it might be a bit of Saturday as well. Record, write, write the next episode because it takes three or four days to write each episode. And then I need to disappear off and film some of the videos to go with the next episodes because there's a few down in Richmond that I need to because we're, we're stretching far west so I need to record those videos and then hopefully get this episode out and have the next one written so I can start recording that one on hopefully Sunday but it'll probably be Monday oh dear lord dear lord oh, could be worse I could be doing a proper job right that's the, that's the end of this episode. Uh, have yourselves a good week. Don't stress about the coronavirus. It's bollocks. Just treat yourself to a cake. Have a cup of tea. Sit down. Chill. Relax. You could get... You could get... You could get run over by a bus. So there we go. <laughs> Happy days. You could get, you, you're more likely to get murdered by a serial killer than you are to contract... The, you're more likely to... No, this is a good stat. You're more likely to get... Struck by lightning, killed by a serial killer, and run over by a bus at the same time, then contract the coronavirus. Hopefully that makes you feel better. Right, go and have a cake, go and have a cup of tea, have yourself a good day. Speak to you all soon. Bye-bye!